Buenas tardes. We have about an hour, hour and a half to go before the end of the conference, before some cocktails for some of you. Um, but I promise it's going to be worthwhile. For those of you just joining us or who weren't in earlier sessions, my name is Christopher Ludwig. I'm the editor of, uh, of Automotive Logistics. And um, welcome again to, to the last session of the day of our inaugural Mexico conference. It's really been a fantastic day so far hearing from the Secretary of the Economy, the U.S. Ambassador to Mexico, many distinguished speakers, not least the Governor of Guanajuato, uh, the Presidents of Ford, Mexico, President of Delphi. Um, really a, a, great, a great first day. I hope you've all enjoyed it so far. We're nowhere near done yet because we have another great panel uh, for, you, for you this afternoon and, and we will continue tomorrow. Um, let me remind you once again about the evaluation forms that you will see on your seat or around you. Um, as Louis mentioned in the last session, please do take the time to fill these in sometime before you leave uh, today and, or tomorrow and, and give them back to us. Since this is the first conference, it's really important to get the feedback from you so that we know how to shape, how to improve, how to continue to attract uh, people, because I can guarantee you we're back here next year. This is, this is obviously not a one-off for us. So really value the feedback you can give. We will have uh, some sort of prize draw at the very end of the conference tomorrow. So that's another reason for you, for you to all stick around. Um, after this session, we do have the, the gala dinner. Uh, that's, you would have had to register for it before, so hopefully you're aware of whether you registered when you registered for the conference. If you're not sure, please check at the registration desk uh, before leaving. I mean, we, uh, admittedly, this conference has had a probably better turnout than we could have really imagined. So, I mean, we are kind of maxed out. So, um, talk to registration and we can see where you're, where, whether you're registered and, and hopefully we get everybody who, who did intend to come uh, to the dinner tonight. Um, just again, a final point as well, you, do, you can log on to the live uh, facility on the website and, and comment and make questions via that. Uh, or indeed using Twitter and other social media. We're trying to be as social media friendly as, as obviously friendly as the Mexican culture is in general. So um, take advantage of that. Okay, in this session, we're gonna be talking about multimodal uh, logistics, building and developing uh, the logistics infrastructure for rail, for, for short C, for of course intermodal. Obviously, we already heard quite a bit about, about those modes and, and some of those challenges today, not least in the last session, which talked about connecting uh, US and Mexico. The uh, Ambassador Wayne mentioned some really important initiatives as well as infrastructure projects, and including, as I understood it, the first new rail bridge crossing since 1910. So good to be finally catching up a little bit there. Hopefully the next one, if needed, will, won't take another 105 years. But uh, I mean, I understand Mexico has a very flexible perception of time, but I, I, think, I think mañana needs to be a bit sooner than that in the future. <laughs> um, we also heard, obviously, uh, the Secretary uh, Guajardo, who this morning, he told, uh, he, he also emphasized many important infrastructure pro excuse me, projects many of them to do with multimodal. But I think he also highlighted the importance of sort of connected planning and, and involvement and thinking. He told the story of this one, I can't remember exactly where, this one big beautiful highway, massive expansion of capacity uh, to a port in which there was no investment to expand that capacity in the port. So kind of did one thing but not the other and obviously created other bottlenecks. I can tell you from, from our, because we do conferences around the world, China, India, Brazil, as well as Europe, and, and actually, that's not such an uncommon thing um, for these projects to not quite connect the way, that, the way they should. It's not easy to get together the federal, state, private, public, all the entities to really plan these projects correctly, which again, I've, I've said it before, but I think it's important that we're all here and that you know, as best we can come together to help with that planning um, to make that efficient. Even China, right, which probably spends the most on infrastructure, at least in developing markets, and certainly has the most streamlined decision-making process. You know, we've seen, you know, bridges virtually to nowhere or huge ports that lack the road or rails to connect them. So that's not, that's not only a Mexican issue. Um, you know, again, I looked at some, some figures before, um, or let's say some, some metrics before this. Uh, I hate to bring them out again, you know, those World Bank Logistics Performance Index or the 
the WEF um, competitive performance. But again, I think it's just worth pointing out where they put Mexico on some of these things. That the WEF puts Mexico's rail infrastructure at uh, 64th in the world. That's behind Botswana and Cameroon. Uh, again, I don't mean to pick on Mexico or our African friends, but it is, it is, um, it is sort of telling to see that, that that comparison. And the ports are 62, just behind Kenya, and this is interesting, behind Austria. Uh, for those of you who are familiar where Austria is, in landlock in the middle of Europe, I'm not quite sure how Austria has better ports than Mexico. Uh, it's a disadvantage for a bit unfair, but... Um, there you go. That's, that's what some of those indicators say. Obviously, we can question those indicators. I mean, they're not, they're not, we can't take, they're not word from God or something, but um, they, do, they do say something. Uh, in automotive, again, I think we are further ahead than those rankings suggest. Um, again, using reference of our other conferences, Brazil, anyone who does business in Brazil knows they would, they would love to have the multimodal services available for, for vehicles or freight that, that we see in Mexico. Uh, India would be another example where it's really only just at the very early stages, maybe 2% of, uh, of vehicles move and just about no freight at all. Um, even China is, is in, 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 in probably overall terms behind. Obviously in Mexico you have very sophisticated links to the rest of North America both by rail, intermodal, and also the short sea, which we see developing on the vehicle side more and more, uh, and also the ports uh, for, the, for the material that's moving in and out. Not to say that there aren't big issues, uh, there certainly are, but I think without these services in place, uh, I'm not sure we would see the billion dollar investments that we are, uh, that would move 80, 70, 80 percent of products over those modes to, uh, to the key markets. So, you know, clearly Mexico, this is a competitive advantage. But we continue to hear about capacity concerns, whether that's tracks and interchanges for rail, wagon and multi-level uh, capacity and availability, perhaps especially for finished vehicle in that regard. Um, and, and of course at ports over congestion and service levels, security, a host of issues, not, not least also frequency of, of, of shipping times and sailings, etc. So there's a lot to discuss, and, and we have a panel that's either going to raise those issues or, or, let's say, tell you all you have nothing to worry about when, when we hear from Ferromex and, and Ferro Cruz about all that's happening there. But um, I think we've got a lot of, lot of room for dialogue and, and a good balanced panel here to, to discuss it. Let me introduce uh, our speakers. We'll first be hearing from Rafael Lopez, who's the Director of Material Planning Logistics for Ford Mexico. And as we saw this morning from the President of Ford Mexico, very, very complex network that that's being managed, a lot of intermodal and, and, and uh, multimodal moves, so a lot to discuss there. Very pleased to also have Alberto Sanchez, who's the Assistant Vice President of Automotive for Ferromex, of course one of the you know, main Class A railroad providers in Mexico. Um, and Alejandro uh, Cutolanc, Head of Commercialization at the Port of Veracruz, which is the largest port in, in Mexico, and, and at least by figures that we use, the largest for vehicle moves in, in North America. Um, so a, a great panel here. We'll, we'll have a presentation, some slides from everybody, and then we will open it up for Q&A from you guys. Uh, so I'd now like to invite Rafael. My name is Rafael López, director of López, director of material planning and logistics for Fort Mexico. First of all, Chris, uh, Luis, thank you all very much for this kind of invitation to participate in this uh, conference and the panel. I was invited to participate in the panel today to talk about intermodal terminals. I will share with you some figures, statistics, uh, pros about intermodal terminals, how many we have, problems and challenges we find for intermodal terminals in Mexico. Next. And this is the basic model pictures in uh, graphical depiction how we see in intermodal we go through ground transportation with a container from a plant where we bring it by highway we go to an intermodal terminal we transfer that to our deck then uh, it is transported by rail and the other way around and we close the cycle again 
the intermodal terminals in Mexico are the following. Mexico has a wide network of intermodal networks providing services to most of the national territory. In accordance to a 1213 census of the Ministry for Communications and Transportation of Mexico, at the time we had 61 intermodal terminals in Mexico, taking into account that they are intermodal, those which provided some uh, uh, ancillary service for the ground transportation. According to the Mexican Association of Intermodal Transportation, for the same time, they talked about 33 intermodal terminals, uh, the AMTI Association. Here we have a difference in the numbers. This is to compare well and to make an equivalence of the numbers. We have to go to the details to see what were the considerations of both institutions. Taking into account the AMIT numbers, we believe that Mexico has 14 interior uh, terminals, 13 on the ports, and six for automotive, um, uh, for cars. These 33 terminals provide complete service. They provide uh, the loading and unloading from rail platforms. They provide service to handle uh, empty containers, empty boxes. They provide uh, ripper service for boxes. And they also provide service, the last mile or terminal to door, from the terminal to the door of the client. The number of uh, terminals over time has been growing according to the industry growth in recent times. The service they provide, we could say, has a standard level of service. What are the advantages of intermodal terminals? One, quality. For example, a very large terminal such as the one in the Valley of Mexico has track and trace service for containers and you can go on the web and have the follow-up from any computer. Quality service is acceptable, fast service in a matter of hours. They uh, unload and uh, they load and then uh, it is ready to go. Trace traceability I talked about and the cost is very competitive. What are the opportunities we see for intermodal terminals. One, small, uh, medium-sized companies should participate in the intermodal area. Usually intermodal service is in the hands of uh, large sea rail companies and uh, it is necessary to promote the terminal to door service. That is to have dom domestic corridors to go to the end point where the goods need to be delivered or the load or the cargo in question. In accordance to the Mexican Association of Intermodal Transportation in AMIT, why is it important to foster domestic uh, corridors in accordance to AMIT data, a survey conducted in 12, uh, 2012, uh, every platform, uh, rail platform, uh, had 770,000 containers, 370 containers by sea, 350,000 cross-border, and only 50,000 uh, were uh, through domestic roads. Another important point for intermodal terminals, they have to be in partnership with international service operators, with international companies, as well as with logistics companies, in order to provide improvement to the current uh, transportation choices. What are the challenges for new intermodal terminals? Well, one, we need to have a short distance between the terminal to industrial parks and cities. Another important one, proximity, closeness to highway transportation and ports. In the past, we used to believe an intermodal terminal would be successful and they would provide very good service if they were close to a railroad track. The very first point is very important to consider the distance 
to the industrial centers as well as to population centers. Another important point I did not include on the slides is the following. In order to locate an intermodal terminal, the geographical location is important and the closeness with other adjacent terminals. For example, in the case of Valley of Mexico terminal within Mexico City proper is a very large terminal, the largest in the whole country in the entire country and we have another terminal in Toluca less than 100 kilometers away Puerta Mexico uh, terminal uh, and um, instead of having a, a complementary service sometimes they are competing in, uh, between themselves there is saturation of offerings in some areas and there is lack of uh, offerings elsewhere the geographical uh, location for future terminals needs to be considered. Uh, I'll answer your questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Overview there of um, <coughs> some intermodal terminals and some of the, the factors that we should consider in making that uh, a more efficient network for Mexico. Next up, we get to hear, I think for the first time today, directly from the railroads, uh, Alberto Sanchez from Ferromex. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Above anything, I would like to share with you the context of evolution of uh, investment in railways in Mexico. That uh, shows where we are going. It's also a way to answer the questions about infrastructure and how to tackle some uh, of the information that has been requested so that you are sensitized and uh, what we expect for the future of this service in Mexico. I will share with you very quickly, the main aspects of this uh, forum, evolution of privatization of railroads, where we are standing from the railroad uh, viewpoint. It may clarify some of the questions asked in the morning, and uh, we'll talk about automotive and intermodal aspects in particular. I want to share with you what the situation was like, the railroad in Mexico before it was privatized. This is uh, the Guadalajara, the so-called roundhouse, the Guadalajara Railroad Yard, when Ferrocarriles Nacionales de Mexico, the national company, was in charge of that. In that national company in 1995, when at the time, basically, the rail market as ground transportation, which is it is competing, uh, dropped 35 and 18 percent. Here, the other part, which was uh, it dropped from 35 to 18 percent, it was a subsidized service with uh, three billion U.S. dollars, uh, from two to three billion U.S. dollars for subsidy for the service. What does this mean? Per every peso paid for freight, the government had to pay 25 cents additionally, and for passengers, 4.9. This means did not have uh, room for invest reinvestment. The service was deteriorated in terms of equipment and infrastructure, and this led to uh, a tight situation for the service. In 1995, the decision was made to privatize the uh, uh, rail service, and I'll talk about uh, the roundhouse now. This is the yard at that time and the uh, rail yard currently. One of the most important situations that had, uh, has happened is the topic of investment at the company level. What we had to do, we have a commitment with the federal government. One of the main missions was to increase quality of infrastructure. Then we have committed our uh, complied with our committed 2.7 times 
more has been invested in comparison to the original commitment on our part. This is important because the rail market is oriented to competitiveness and profitability. This has to be based on the cargo capacity to give you more information in our case in particular 27 percent of our revenues are reinvested in infrastructure and in most of the industries rails as shown here in comparison with other industries is very much aimed aimed at reinvesting one of the main points that uh, entailed the main changes with the privatization we went from capacity to give you an example on average rail cars that you see in red at the bottom 30 uh, cars now the capacity went from 30 cars to 120 cars this is one of the main drivers not only to increase the infrastructure capacity but also the length of the rail car uh, the number of rail cars to make it more competitive and to divide the cost into the number of cars this is ferromex at a glance who we are as a company uh, a thousand people taking care of these two thousand security elements 6,000 miles of trucks we take care of, 800 uh, locomotives, 8 ports, 4 borders, and market share of 65%, which has also been increasing in terms of uh, the rail market. For us in, in this forum, uh, one of the questions was how we have evolved to go from a general cargo rail system with a specific cargo. This is the division of our market segment. As of last year, automotive was ranking second in importance within the rail market. This is important in automotive, industrial and intermodal Topics or areas are the ones that have been growing more in our industry, which was the area where there were more opportunities. For automotive, one of the main advantages we have is how we have evolved in the intermodal network, where we have our, the share of the market and how we have worked to take care of the markets. Another important point is the fact that most automotive plants are next to access to rail in order to solve transportation to other markets R rail has been key therefore we have had uh, growth in Mexico just to give you an idea in particular in the integrated logistics we are part of the largest network in all North America which operates under the same standards all the way from Canada through the US and Mexico this allows to have integrated logistics to final distribution points which connects us with the distribution and the growth that we have seen in recent times we started for you to have an idea how the business has been growing we started with less than half a million uh, vehicles now 1.7 vehicles were transported last year the, all the growth is related to what we have achieved with this industry and the new opportunities uh, for the new inv the additional investment in the country why is rail important now with simple numbers out of every 100 vehicles that are sold in the united states on average 10 are assembled in mexico out of every 10 we are fortunate to transport at least six six in the uh, rail therefore the rail has been specialized to become a logistics solution for the country which has allowed to create infrastructure growth and uh, a transportation advantage uh, for competitiveness in Mexico briefly I'll talk about intermodal service in this case 
as it was said before we have been able to take care of four main industries particularly for the automotive industry which is one of the main users this is how we have evolved in part and what has allowed us to be specialized uh, in cargo instead of handling general cargo what is the advantage offered by uh, the rail rail on long distance and this has been a recent launching in the intermodal program efficiency and ex accessibility intermodal gives you the choice to connect those points where there is not a direct uh, connection with rail to get these connection points closer and to be competitive for long distances so we use that to have rail on the long distances and we are able to have connectivity for short uh, sections with uh, truck where we can have complementary multimodal services and we are not competing one against the other the most gen the more general things we take care of is multi level for finished assembled cars we also have the choice and accessibility by rail cars another specific mode uh, with uh, in the automotive industry for heavier uh, car uh, low weather axles engines transmissions which are uh, using those and in particular in the case of diluted or general or lighter cargo we use intermodal service we have made progress to trigger services in our network and this is what we have been able to achieve in the intermodal service for domestic cross-border and sea services here something very important in cross-border service which is one of the main options that we have triggered recently it has worked wonderfully with new terminals and new projects particularly in Monterrey or new projects that have come later from Silao other opportunities we are analyzing from the integral manner understanding the growth and the evolution of what our clients need. This is my presentation. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Alberto. Everyone in this room who, who knows and uses, you know, it's, uh, rail in, in Mexico knows how important Ferromex is and, and as well as, as KCM. So, KSCM. So, obviously, getting a, this overview is going to be important for our QA when I think we can probably dig into some other, other issues that we're also seeing. But before that, let's, uh, let's, let's also get the perspective of the ports here. Uh, I'd like to invite Alejandro Kutulenk from the Port of Veracruz. Muy buenas tardes, tengan todos ustedes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this important automotive logistics forum thank you i want to thank them for the invitation to be here and state some situations from the automotive industry in mexico and the port of veracruz we are all convinced how important automotive industry growth represents for our country in the coming years however this growth for all of us parts of the logistic chain makes us to be more responsible and try to be even more responsible yet in the log logistic chain due to this industry's growth. How? Increasing efficiency, productivity, reducing costs, and making this more interesting for all stakeholders of the industry. In Veracruz, we are aware of this situation. And briefly, I want to explain some of the things we're doing to improve intermodality and improve our port's infrastructure since a good number of vehicles for export or from imports are transported through Mexican ports. Briefly, I think you are all familiar 
the location of the four major ports in Mexico. In this case is Veracruz, which is a port I will refer to Altamira, also Lázaro Cárdenas and Manzanillo. As for our hinterland, Veracruz has a hinterland with a span of 15 states from the center of the Republic, Mexico City, Puebla and Veracruz, where approximately we have a population of 66 million people, 68% of our GDP and 0.3% of our national territory. However, now that we are referring to the automotive industry, I want to highlight that the automotive hub, which is our main hinterland, as we've seen throughout all the sessions today, several automotive industries from that region use the port of Veracruz. Also, the port of Veracruz is the main port of Mexico managing vehicles. 60% of this management is conducted through the port of Veracruz. 78% goes for exports and the remaining from imports. I think we've seen this map early this morning where all the automotive industry facilities are located in our country and the center of our country would would be part of our users, Puebla as well as Morelos. This would be the hinterland, hinterland we provide service for the automotive industry, not only for vehicles, but also for auto parts, steel tubing that are used for this industry. As for railroads, I think it's worth to mention a logistic advantage important for Veracruz, which is the single port in Mexico where the two railroad companies in Mexico, and I say two because Ferrosur and Ferromex, I think they are one, I hope I am not corrected, and Kansas City, these two companies arrive to the port of Veracruz. I insist this is the single port in Mexico that has this great advantage. Another advantage for this is twice stockpiling in containers and these reduces uh, traveling cost and the railroad traveling uh, it's also used for vehicles and this also helps reducing costs. As for railroads in Veracruz, well Veracruz is a port with 110 years old. The Railroad in red divides the city in two, crosses more than 150 neighborhoods in the city, and efficiency and productivity is hindered because of all of these situations. However, in Veracruz, we are developing this green line, which is a belt road of almost 20 kilometers that li starts in the port and will arrive to Santa Fe. Santa Fe is the area where both Ferrosur and Kansas arrive to this facility. Right now, Kansas City uses Fer Ferrosur railways to arrive to the port, but in the future when this Bell Road starts operation, both Kansas City and Ferrosur may be able to arrive to the port through this line. We believe that when this is completed by the end of the, this year, 90-95% of railway traffic will be conducted through here and this will reduce, th th the current line will cease operation. This is an important part of the railway in Veracruz. This is conducted through the port administration and in the following months we will decide how this section will be managed. Probably we'll make some partnership. It's still under study trying not to increase the cost of 
of the use of these lines. Also, another great advantage that we have in Veracruz are two main highways arriving and departing from Veracruz. One reaching Córdoba, then Puebla, and then the northern arc, and then connecting to the center of our country. And the other way is through Jalapa, Pelote, Perote, arriving at Puebla. You can get to Mexico City or also with the northern arc. This would be a shortcut, reducing the number of kilometers substantially. other activities in Veracruz to benefit this intermodality and security. We build this logistic hub for transportation with the capacity of 150 trucks. Trucks arrive to the port whenever they feel like they parked, whenever they feel like, and this difficulted all movements in within the port installation. And now transport can enter the port when the licensee loads or unloads upon permits. We have some electronic readers for license plates also barcode scanners, driver's licenses for operators. And throughout the years, we have had this system in operation. We have grown a uh, broad database. We pr provide in security both for operators and cargos. These are the booms that allow entering or not. We also have sanitary facilities for operators. I don't want to expand on this. This is also good for the automotive industry, providing security when their cargo is concerned. Briefly, we manage uh, 600,000 units, 1.5 million tons in Veracruz and throughout the ports of our country due to economic situations of those countries which are destination for vehicles from the US, Europe and South America accumulating 21,000 tons. This is the yearly vehicles movements broken down by port this past year, we managed 1.14 million vehicles through Veracruz. And for Veracruz, these are the figures for the past six years. As you can see, since the year 2012, we moved 875,000 units. And we dropped this figure down to 680,000. And this is not because they are departing from other ports, because the movement in other ports has been reduced or that they are transported through ground transportation. It is because consumption has been reduced in those years in Europe, the US, and South America. Here we have the same graph, only for Veracruz, eight so far accumulated this year 683,000 units and we hope that with the new facilities and the boom in the economy these figures will increase. This is the national movements in ports. Veracruz managed 69 percent of all cargo, Lázaro Cárdenas 26 percent, Altamira close to 7 percent, Acapulco close to 6 percent and Manzanillo 1.1 percent. We manage 1,142,000 units. As for how these units had arrived or departed to and from the port, 38, almost 39% has been moved through railway from the assembly facilities, and 61% has been moved to what we call Holloways. And this situation has improved thanks to railway transportation assembly companies are trying to ship their vehicles or to collect them mainly to ship them for exports through railway uh, in the case of impo we use hallways because they go to points of sales as for 
wharves. This is a diagram of the port of Veracruz, 110 years old with some constraints. We have these four wharves which are priority for the automotive industry, loading and unloading activities. Some of the lines that we manage and their periodicity and their destinations. And as for railways, in the port within the port facilities we have 15 mainly destined for the automotive industry where we can manage up to 153 to three level wagons and uh, here are shown in red where vehicles are loaded and unloaded as for the map where we have areas to manage vehicles we have two licenses one is ssa with two areas here we have a garage with capacity for four thousand cars and here uh, for three thousand units another license uh, Licensee is CPV that ma has a capacity for 2,000 units. The yellow areas are for port administration, also areas that are leased through licenses or directly to uh, automotive companies in order to park their cars. Approximately, we could have at a certain point 32,000 units what is important here is to say that the port may have more or less units statically wise depending on how fast vehicles are moved within the port. Sometimes some assembly industries that use our, gar our facilities as garage and they are left there 15 to 28 days. The idea is if we had 50 weeks with these figures, we could reach up uh, a figure of management of 1 million cars per year. These are our two licenses in the port, SSA Mexico, uh, brands they manage within the license they have in the port of Veracruz, and also we have CPB, Corporación Portuaria de Veracruz, which is the other maneuvering company that manages vehicles in the port and also manages these brands. The main exporters of the port of Veracruz, Volkswagen, Nissan, Chrysler, Ford, and so on, and all European products that you know are the ones that arrive to the port. Also, Porsche is here along with BMW, Volvo, and the vast majority of European cars arrive to a port of Veracruz. A port security, I will skip this. I do not want to take any longer. What I want to stress is that the port of Veracruz is the safest and more secure port in Veracruz. All merchandise, all goods coming in and out is double checked with gamma rays and also for container movements through railroads. This is our fire department, people that constantly survey the, the port apart from the Secretary of Marine and the Army, which are present in the port. Our quality brand was implemented three years ago. It is called Calidad Puntual, following the methodology from the Port of Barcelona. The objective was to detect inefficiency of processes, handling goods, and reduce time and cost fast. Within the automotive industry, we have achieved to import priority containers for the automotive industry. It took us six calendar days upon the arrival and departure of the container and now we do this in no more than 24 hours. The, for this we had the collaboration of customs, um, the licensee and many other improvements that I will 
I may discuss in another occasion, but what is important is that for vehicles, we implemented this methodology and we are developing a series of activities to improve exports vehicles by railway imports of vehicles by hallways and quality control of vehicles in the port. Briefly, this is the current facility of the port in light brown. This is the expansion of the port currently in process. The area for logistic activities five kilometers away from the port and this area for logistic activities may be important for the automotive industry. Whomever establishes here doesn't need to be part of a bid. This is a licensee agreement where we lease areas for whomever will lease them for 15, 20 years. Another one, this is not for sale, it is only for lease. Everything that comes in here is tax-free as long as it remains in this area. This is kind of a tra free trade zone. And in this area, all these activities may be conducted while they cannot be possible in the port facilities. The goods may remain six months without causing abandonment different from a fiscal area that they have a, a, a time limit. Briefly also I want to take this opportunity, although it is not related directly to the automotive industry is the expansion of the port. This port is old, as I have said, more than 110 years old. We are saturated. Our facilities are not enough for companies managed uh, cargo. We cannot receive ships longer than 325 meters. Uh, like post Panama Plus and greater, and uh, we need a more efficient and modern infrastructure. F so, in order to accommodate new ships circulating in our country, we the limit for the ships we can receive is 325 meters. This is the expansion project separated in two stages. The first one is the construction of a sea wall. Uh, the construction of two containers terminals with two port eight port positions and a marginal line of 2.5 kilometers and a terminal for bulk material. This will be completed by the year 2018 and has a public investment of 60, 16 billion pesos and a private investment of 8 million pesos. So while these two terminals or areas, which are each of 90 hectares, totaling 180 hectares, can be full of containers, and we are saying about 6 million containers, uh, this is a one of our goals. In these areas, we can serve the automotive industry as parking spaces and wharves to receive ships. This has 18 meters deep, the new port uh, facilities of 600 and 800 and the second stage of the construction for the year 2030 is foreseeing a special facilities for these terminals. This is a comparison of our current facilities, 18 port spaces, and we are expanding to 35. We can move up to 118 million tons. I had skipped this slide. The investment is 70 million pesos, 60% comes from private funding and 40% from public funds. This is the whole of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I will be more than glad to answer any question. Thank you.
Alejandro, and indeed to all of our panelists. Um, again, uh, interesting to, to get the full view of, of, of the port there. Um, I think some of that's those details at the end about expansion and, and you know what being able to handle more vessels or overcome some of the current limits, I actually do think that's quite relevant to many in the audience here, even if it's not directly um, for Roro there, but I think the, the capacity and the uh, impacts are important, especially with some of the bigger, larger vessels that are coming out now. Um, so we've got some time for Q&A, um, about 20 minutes, if we, can, if we have that many questions. I already see a hand up, so I'm going to stop right there in the middle, and then we'll move forward. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Roberto Michel, de SS Line. Una pregunta que... From SS Line, perhaps this question is apt for the three speakers. Which has been the factor? How do you assess the percentual cost of insecurity? How this has impacted and which have been your measures? Perhaps you can elaborate on that. I know that in Mexico we don't like to discuss this, but it's a reality. Well, well, and security certainly has been an issue in Mexico at a company level. And in our particular case, with almost 9,000 kilometers of railways, the area to protect is rather wide, large. This means that you must assign a budget of billions of dollars per year just to hire 2,000 security elements at your expense. So this becomes something that should be included in your costs and becomes a complicated situation. So this is a reality and we cannot be witnessing this uh, without doing many things. However, we trust that the joint strategies with the federal government and with the private investment and with internal strategies is going to complement and solve many of these issues that certainly it's one of the things that damage our, our sending before our customers. Front, unless anyone else wants to comment there. Bueno, eh, Iván Hernández, uh, Daimler en, en la región de NAFTA. Eh, mi pregunta es con respecto a la velocidad de implementación de los diferentes proyectos de expansión que ustedes tienen planeado. Projects that you have planned. Our company is investing in Mexico uh, with joint venture with Nissan. We are producer of the largest commercial vehicles with facilities in Santiago de Angistengo and Saltillo, and we are going to use the port of Veracruz to ship units to the U.S. And the concern is, are you going to be ready? So for when we have our production facilities at full speed and when all the suppliers that we are trying to relocate from the U.S. to Mexico are located in Mexico, are you going to be ready? Is the railroad be in operation and will it have the capacity to meet the needs of transportation because we are talking about five million vehicles and these cars and with the those come all the suppliers and inputs so are you going to be ready do you have contingency plans ready well as for the port we hope we expect to be ready. We are working in all the necessary infrastructure in order to support this important growth from the automotive industry. I think that in this word support, not only the port per se takes part, but also the transport means that I need 
to take the vehicles to be shipped or to receive the vehicles that will arrive. This is important within this growth logistic because if vehicles come and I cannot take them with sufficient speed, uh, I will have an issue of occupancy in the port and I th there will be no uh, space where to store these vehicles in these logistic areas that I show you at the end where it is an area of 135 hectares that is up to lease when I'm sure that Roro ships will be able to port and where both railway companies will arrive regardless of the current ports facilities will give us the possi uh, a wider possibility to meet this demand. In the port currently we are trying to implement extra shifts for vehicles arriving and for vehicles departing from the port. We are setting lightning uh, so that at night time these cars may be loaded and are loaded. Also we are implementing several programs through our platform which is called Mediport in order to coordinate with the assembly company and have a schedule report of the time for arrival and departure. This is done through this platform to join forces and have the, pos the possibility to anticipate the activities. We need to work railway companies and ports hand to hand in order to in order to support this growth. And as for specific areas we are problem problem free. As for wharves we have no issue there, uh, although currently we are under some constraints and sometimes rural shipments have to wait for a, a while, uh, but with the new expansion by the year 2018 we will provide a much better service. I don't know if I answer your question, I don't know if Alberto wants to answer. My comment is in our specific case, our operation of this growth and the planning to meet the growth of new automotive facilities represents a great progress of the organic road, as we call it. We began two years before these facilities started operation. As reference, it got to a certain degree where we had op meetings with future customers in order to meet their needs without damaging the current conditions of the service. So what we are doing right now is harvesting a strong investment program that was approved in this company of more than 500 billion dollars in a pe for a period of five years and the impact of the importance of this investment in our network was measured in the specific case of trucks our participation is not within finished vehicles because of the constraints that we have because of the characteristics of the North American vehicles. Uh, we can share the fleet with the US and Canada and this provides full advantage which would, which would be a total advantage like in the case of Daimler in the Aguascalientes production. We haven't found a way, a profitable way to serve the other segments of the market. Complemented to Alejandro's comment, for the case of Veracruz, we have a long-term plan of which would be the request and how we can add to this effort because Veracruz represents an important operation for our company representing 30% of the volume 
that we manage. Not only have we developed a long-term plan, but we also have a short-term plan that will help us implement these activities and in terms of the port's current capacities. But we ha we didn't start now, we started two years ago. We are ready to serve and we are encouraged by the future opportunities, so we realize we must be ready, and we will. Gracias a ambos por sus respuestas. ¿Alguna otra pregunta o comentario del público? Good afternoon. I am Alfredo Monroy from BMW. I have a question for Alberto. Regarding costs, I think that your presentation was based in vehicles as for finished vehicle and I think that the intermodal model is interesting, but I am concerned about inbound, particularly components. BMW will start in 2018. Regarding cost, I have a uh, reference that cost and lead time intermodally between the US and Mexico didn't fit my business case. According to your cost, which are the most important considerations and OEM should consider for frequency, is it capacity of intermodal, how many units are placed by transport, which is the impact uh, as cost driver, because for the OEM in this case, BMW was didn't fit, didn't meet the, the, the business case, because we will bring engines and transmissions, and perhaps it would be better for us intermodal. Uh, uh, but I would like to know your perspective. Well, what I can tell you, it is clear to us that the logic of our customers is inventory in transit has a cost, and this is complemented with the transport rate. The advantage that we have in and a specific example, as you said, engines and transmission, a high capacity wagon, the advantage it provides is that the cost due to the weight it can withhold is profitable. Intermodal mode doesn't mean that we it is not appropriate for this cargo. However, it is oriented to lighter weight cargo that requires other consolidation processes and this is where things get difficult because they compete against trucks. So I would say that perhaps uh, the cost is not properly calculation if something doesn't click in engines and tr transmission it necessarily shouldn't be intermodal but also intermodal and assembly industry cannot bear the weight of creating the corridors. The competition with the truck is that this corridor exists and uh, I must be competitive, otherwise my business is non-existent. So if something doesn't work, and even in the automotive industry, because of volume and frequency, has the advantage that it may generate their own terminals, which do not rely on third party company, third parties. I think you should redo and have the proper advice, because there should be an opportunity to serve this participation, which is our natural business. We will never be faster than any truck, but we can move more at a better price. that because your, your response focused uh, on the weight and calculations, but is there also issues about intermodal connectivity with the southeast, specifically of the U.S.? I mean, in some ways, it seems that the connectivity is stronger to the, to the Midwest for in particularly inbound parts and such. I mean, um, have you looked to work with other U.S. partners to improve service effectively to areas where BMW or, or others would be in the southeast? Okay, just to understand very briefly the what we have in the scope is that we have the huge advantage that we connect to the both railroads that actually have connection to the U.S. border. So that gives us the advantage that they have to complement our network, despite that our network it, it could be more simple in terms of the final destinations. We have the huge advantage that they have to generate the cargo in different points. As Julie was mentioning in the, giving us a very brief scope in terms of uh, 
what is the common origins or the consolidating points in the US network that needs to be complemented to what is the area that they have to attend. For example, with our competitors that they are strong in the San Luis Potosi area, we're strong in the Silao area, and those areas need to complement each other. So we definitely look at those opportunities that's only based in the, not only in the automotive business, but in the rest of the type of cargo that goes to Mexico. So they totally are complementary, and I think we have uh, good products that we are developing little by little. Simply, we didn't have a couple of new services that were what we call cross-border, and we just launched those two new services, and we're already exploring new origins and destinations in the U.S. Okay, thank you. I think we had a few more hands up if anybody else has a question that hasn't been addressed at this time. Right in the front. Gracias. Alfonso Rodriguez, General Motors. Alfonso Rodriguez with GM. Alejandro, a question. We recently had a concern with the quality of uh, cars in uh, the port of Veracruz because of uh, the saltiness. What protection are you giving against saltiness environment of Veracruz if the car stays long there? That's a tough question to answer. As you say, saltiness of Veracruz port is high. We have problems sometimes with some brands. Some have detected the issue and this is not an excuse. This also had to do with the quality of a component of a car. However, the idea first is to foster construction of park garage to have them covered. A park garage is expensive to keep seven, eight thousand cars, maybe eight hundred million dollars. This investment cannot be done by the port authority. This would have to be done by the operators of uh, the vehicles. We are working on that. Somebody is interested in that. Also, we are thinking about yards to have some barriers to have some what protection, not a hundred percent protection, because the wind blows this at this level and also from above something is protected but if we can do something it's kind of a difficult situation one of the problems one of the issues the salinity or saltiness in the state of veracruz in the city of Vera, uh, porto veracruz last year there were no complaints for salinity however it also depends on the assembly companies if uh, there is a good scheduling of exports and if they leave the car in the yards in order to be loaded three or four days after nothing will happen if the assembly company leaves them 15 or 20 days to send them to the sale uh, point well that may be a difficult situation i talked about this we are trying to work with the assembly company assemblers with two objectives to reduce the stay time on uh, the port for the cars and uh, number one to tackle and take care of the saltiness issue and uh, second to have more capacity to generate uh, to better rotate inventory i yeah. would like to call Quisiera hablar de la situación what we are doing ford company mexico has suffered from saltiness salinity we know this problem very well in the case of veracruz alejandro was saying cars cannot stay long three four days we have found a period of time when cars can be safely six days is our what we have found six days is okay so we have a coordination with the sea companies the way maritime companies with the rail and uh, that way we logistic uh, coordinate the logistic chain i send uh, cars from hermosillo to veracruz to be sent to central america or 
North America or also from Cuautitlan plan to go to Central America or North America through Veracruz. We take into account the rail transit time and we schedule when the, the rail departs to stay as little as possible in the port of Veracruz, no more than six days. That's why it is important also for Alberto to give us reliability in as to the transit times, another point that we do. Sometimes it is not possible to be there less than six days. There may be a delay because of north winds or uh, the uh, ship is there but it cannot depart because uh, north winds. So we have some uh, measures, uh, simple wash of the car and we also have critical parts protection coating, the chrome uh, parts, the body parts and we apply this whenever we know the car will stay longer. Sometimes it's not possible to stay there less than seven, six days if there are a thousand cars on the port and there is a three day delay for the ship it will take me three days to bring them out of the port and then it will take me three days to bring them back to the port it is not practical that's uh, the solution we have uh, found for our cars yeah, thank you, Rafael, for that, that um, very specific in insight on that. Obviously, saltiness is a difficult, thing, difficult aspect. I don't know, maybe we should try shipping some tequila in to, to <laughs> soak it up or so, but maybe that's just my own fantasy. Um, uh, any other questions <laughs> from the floor? Sorry, yeah, we have one there. ¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes. Yo soy Gustavo Maya de... Hello, I am uh, uh, Gustavo Maya with WW. One of the recommendations for this type of correction for corrosion is to have yards away from the port. In this case, we have a solution. It's 20 uh, kilometers away from the port uh, in Wallenius uh, Wilhelmsen Logistics, and this solves part of the problem. I start the session morning. tomorrow morning on finished vehicle logistics. I should remind you where we can also dig deeper into some of these topics. Um, any other questions? Maybe uh, another one from me, Alberto. Can you give us any any sense of have you tracked the progress on velocity in in the rail network over the last few years? I mean, there was obviously some big weather disruptions last year that had were in the north that may have had impacts down here as well. Um, but in general, has there been a trend towards higher velocity, stable? Have you seen decreases, and what measures are you taking? That um, that's directly and indirectly uh, related to us. One of the things that it's obviously uh, one of the things that our operational teams, they, it's part of their lead metrics is obviously the speed of our network, right? So anything that goes, and obviously they have to increase their goal uh, little by little, but the average speed of our network is 30 kilometers per hour, right? Now, in the specific topic that you are talking about, that's a more complex thing. With the advantage that we have with this lending equipment between Canada, US, and Mexico, we have certain points in the network where we actually generate empties and a lot of flow of those empties come into Mexico. Mexico's uh, market is not that big, so the nature of the plants in Mexico, it's a lot of export. So that's why a lot of empties have to come into Mexico and a lot of loaded leave Mexico on rail. So the tricky part on that specific thing is that when we had the very bad weather at the beginning of the year, we were getting out first of a common period where most of the automotive plants have a shutdown. Then when you start getting that network back into track, we had given the weather conditions shorter trains that needed to run and if you run shorter trains you need more assets mm -hmm. and you start running out of assets so it starts to get into a snowball but yeah. not to get too specific it's part of the advantages and sometimes the disadvantages that you have in this cooperation network that we call the TTX reload so mm -hmm. that was the specific issue and here many friends that are present in the room reminded vividly so yeah. <laughs> I think snowballed was a probably an apt <laughs> word there. <laughs> um, another question for Alejandro. Um, 
I mean, again, this might be more in some ways for terminal operators, but uh, at other ports in North America, like Baltimore or LA, uh, Long Beach, there's a lot of services carried out on vehicles, accessorization, modification, technical work as such. To what extent do you see that in Veracruz, and uh, is that developing? Is it too much of a capacity issue because of the focus on getting the cars out? Just thought maybe some observations on that. Sí, mira, eh, some constraint in a port, we cannot have modifications. CPB has, for example, the so-called body shop, uh, workshop, where we take care of minor things, the paint or scratches, but to provide the accessories, accessorization, something deeper, cannot be done in comparison with logistic zones I talked about. In those zones, accessorization, well, you may do whatever you want. There are no constraints from the government for that. However, I believe, given the importance of the automotive industry in Mexico, we can exert pressure for the regulations to be modified, amended for the automotive industry, allowing more possibilities for accessorization or any other changes you need to make uh, on the cars when they are on the port. Of course, we have thought about it. This is part of the reason of the logistic activity zone, to have added value for the importation and exportation goods. Added value by uh, goods, I mean vehicles as well. Thank you. Maybe the last question from my side could be for Rafael, since you're a um, customer of the sort of services and infrastructure that, that the other gentlemen are describing. Uh, what would you specifically hope to see from the rail and from the ports uh, over, let's say, the next three to five years as you're looking at what, what's happening for Ford and as the industry moves to five million? Nosotros esperamos en el futuro nuestra visión a futuro con las compañías de ferrocarril. Número uno es el problema que ha comentado Alberto, tenemos un shortage de plataformas, no nada más en México, lo tenemos en Canadá, en México y en Estados Unidos. Es un problema, nos gustaría ver más colaboración entre las empresas ferroviarias, o sea, a veces… A veces tenemos algunos inconvenientes en quién te pone los vacíos y quién se lleva los llenos. Y finalmente, mis autos y mis clientes no saben si lo transporta X o Y compañía. Yo tengo que cumplir objetivos de salida, de exportación y de llegada a tiempo. Entonces, yo creo que es un punto, es un punto de mejora y, y este, a mí como cliente me gustaría ver más cooperación entre ambas empresas ferroviarias. Eh, con el caso de, de los puertos, vemos posibilidad de desarrollar otros puertos, o sea, tenemos, hay planes de, como todas las industrias, afortunadamente, automotriz en México, hay planes de incrementos de producción, creemos que hay posibilidades de desarrollar otros puertos que nos den más ventaja en o tiempos de tránsito, en, este, en costos. En el caso de Veracruz… Costs. Uh, In the case of Veracruz, we have a great communication with the, with the port of Veracruz, with Alex Alejandro in particular, uh, we get all his support. Yes, of course, we hope all the infrastructure plans are completed in due time, as he talked about that, and we are also working on the development, we need the development of more ports. Also. We need more flexibility in ports, like Alejandro said, to have more activities in the, like uh, uh, personalization, accessorization, to take advantage. We are the cars waiting. The vision is that the value chain, the logistics chain, should be seen as added value aspect, and to take advantage of the time the cars stay there at some point to add value for accessorization. Okay, well, I mean, it, the question is more, in some ways, for your colleagues to your right, to your right there. So hopefully they were listening, paying close attention. 
Um, I, I think we can probably end it there unless anybody has a burning desire to ask another question, uh, but in which case I'd probably recommend that we continue that over beer and tequila. Um, <laughs> I want to thank our, our panel for, for a fantastic discussion, really ending a great, a great day here. So a round of applause for them. Can I just remind everybody to hand your headsets back in at the, at the desk? You know, I, they're, unfortunately, they're not going to work when you take them out on the street or to the gala dinner to translate. Um, I mean, you might be able to block out the sound of who you're talking to, but I just recommend using your iPhone or iPad for that and stuff. So please, please return those uh, on your way out. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the gala dinner and registered for it, there's going to be coaches outside the transporters there, or you can obviously, if you have your own cars, you can you can follow us as well. But um, we're really looking forward to to seeing all of you back uh, here tomorrow morning. We have an, uh, more great sessions planned, and thanks again to all of you who have participated.